Hey, howdy ho, it is your ho, Tim here. Welcome back to another video. I just need a moment of your time. You can skip through this first intro bit if you'd like. It's just an overview. I have a little bit of explaining to do. This is the last official series I am ever going to upload on this channel. There may be some miscellaneous videos here and there, but this is it. Vanguard's doo-doo. Zombies doesn't have an exceptionally bright future going forward, and I am going to be moving on from zombies content, but I still have six videos for you. Each one being an analysis video of each Treyarch Zombies game. It's a lot like the map analysis series, except we're going to be analyzing the game as a whole. This is, of course, episode one of six, and this is going to be World at War, where it all began. This is also the first time I have ever written a script for a video. You know, I've organized my thoughts in notebooks before, but I've never written a script. Pretty much everything on my channel is improv. So, this is a very, very different set of videos than the usual ones. So while I'm not clinging to new games coming out, I am going to show my love and appreciation and gratitude for these old games that have gotten me to where I am in life right now. It's kind of my childhood, and I feel like I owe this game, and I feel like I have some final thoughts on all of these games. Enjoy. It all began somewhere in German-occupied Europe, June 1945. A plane comes crashing down in an airfield. Few escape the scene. A small, decrepit bunker protrudes the thick fog. The remaining soldiers reconvene inside with a false sense of protection. Little time goes by before the echo of wooden planks being ripped off the wall fills the room. All men on high alert. Shuffling through the fog are dozens of the undead. They soak up too much of my colt. These bullets aren't gonna cut it. Wait a minute. I see something on the wall over there. Uh, looks like the car. Wait, what? 200 bucks? Where's the money coming from? I must be making money from killing these guys. Uh, better keep at it. Bullets are flying and bodies are dropping. The end begins. But in the corner of the room is a vibrant glow, a beam of hope, a wooden box placed on the ground by the Lord himself. 950 bucks? I'm not made of money here. Ugh, fuck it. Intrigue and mystery of the box overwhelms. Spin after spin, gun after gun, he finally pulls the almighty ray gun. Whoa, this thing is otherworldly. It must have been handcrafted by aliens or something. Oh, I'm melting right through them. <laughs> Maybe this can keep us alive until the horde washes over. But alas, the horde proves too much for the men as they each drop one by one. It's a tough scene to endure, watching your brothers get ripped open and gutted. Nocturne Toten, or Knight of the Living Dead, is as bare bones as it gets. A knife, a couple of grenades, and no clue what's going on is what you spawn in with. There are chalk outlines of weapons riddled all over the walls. Some low-end rifles, some SMGs, some shotguns, but if you're a high flyer, a gambler, I'd recommend the good old mystery box. You could get something really shitty, but you could also get something even better than what's available to you on the wall. You have a choice. You can have the boat or the mystery box. What, are you crazy? We'll take the boat. No, no, no not so fast, Lois. A boat's a boat, but the mystery box could be anything. It could even be a boat! Check out this bad boy. Courtesy of the box. This is the kind of firepower you're gonna need to survive. Take it and run. Now go to that corner over there and stand perfectly still. Don't move! Moving around is the worst possible thing you could be doing right now. The further away, the safer. Now point straight and shoot. At least the universe isn't totally cruel. Looks like you've also got some power-ups to help you. There's an insta-kill, which, well... Instantly kills. Double points, max ammo, carpenter, which rebuilds all the barriers on the map, and the nuke, which does nuclear stuff. But yeah, other than that, the world is against you. 
Do your best to survive. There's nothing else you can do. After Nock's unexpected success, Treyarch knew they had something special with this mode, and so they began to take this side ambition a bit more seriously. About a half year later, DLC 1 for World at War released, and with the three multiplayer maps came a brand new zombies experience. Verrucht. German for crazy! It fittingly takes place in an abandoned insane asylum. Four Marines, consisting of the famous Tank Dempsey and some lesser knowns, are here in hopes of retrieving one Peter McCain, who was sent to spy on Group 935 by the OSS in October 1945. Now, Group 935 had been experimenting on patients here in horrific fashion. All right, and Element 115 has risen them from the dead. From the very beginning, you're separated from your allies. An inaccessible door borders you and your friends forcing you to turn the other way and fight, kill by kill, door by door. You battle your way through this hellhole until you meet in the middle, where the brand new power switch resides. Being separated from your friends in your most vulnerable phase breeds terror. In some cases, depending on how many people you're playing with, you're completely alone until you scrape together the points to open up the half dozen or so doors. There aren't any second chances. The whole facility is charged up, including those mysterious soda machines scattered around the place. You see, Treyarch knew that Nox formula wouldn't be sustainable for a second time, so improvements were necessary. Some inspiration is pulled from multiplayer's perk system, as four new abilities are added to zombies in the form of chemically engineered beverages, or Perca-Colas. Quick Revive Soda, for a low cost of 1,500 points, allows you to revive your teammates faster. Double Tap Root Beer, for 2,000 points, increases your rate of fire. Speed Cola, for three grand, speeds up your hands in what they do, most notably reloading by double. But lastly, and most importantly, we have the almighty must-have Juggernaug, which, for 2,500 points, increases your strength to five hits per down, rather than the measly default two. Though all helpful, Jug is the clear outlier. It's regularly selected first amongst them all. It proved especially helpful for World at War in hindsight, as the zombies are just so glitchy and unpredictable that getting double swiped is all too common. These perk machines have life, personality to them, you know? You see the warm glow out of the corner of your eye, hear the jingle softly in the distance pulling you in, trying to close the sale. They wasted no time becoming iconic. Eventually, the sodas could be recognized just about anywhere, and greatly contributed to zombies being taken seriously at that point in time. The perks quickly became a staple in the mode, returning in the vast majority of maps going forward. It was an easy, yet enormous, enhancement to make. The layout of Verrucht, interestingly, is sort of the inverse of Nox. Noct is smaller, but more open, whereas Verrucht is larger, but tighter. The hallways are small and just about two zombies wide. There really isn't much space to breathe. The map absolutely aims to suffocate you. Thankfully, another big innovation helps with this, the electric trap. There's several, actually, and they're riddled around the map, each next to a key camping spot. For a thousand points, you get 30 seconds of some electroshock therapy for the zombies, which is just a, about the only realistic shot you have at surviving long term. Problem is, they need to recharge after each use, and the cost adds up quickly, so even that strategy is practical only for so long. This map aims to challenge you in a whole new way. It gives you some of the icing, but tears out half the cake, stripping you of any comfort. Additionally, the mystery box doesn't stay put anymore. On Verrucked, it moves around after so many uses, and there's various locations for it. To pile on even more to its lack of comfort, Verruck's atmosphere scares the shit out of you. Remember how I mentioned that this takes place in an asylum? And it's like full of zombies? Yeah, that's just scratching the surface of it. Between the echoing screams of the patients, the creepy ass carnival music, 
and the plentiful blood, fire, and rubble, this map is flat out bone chilling. Varuk takes pride in its difficulty and horror. When you think of the scariest maps ever, this one ought to be top of the list. It's genuinely eerie. The feeling of anguish and despair engulfs you the way it did the patients here. The map layout engulfs you as well. This map is no walk in the park. It's one of the hardest maps ever. Play at your own risk. Zombies is steadily gaining popularity, but a change of scenery would be great. Both previous maps share core values and have similar atmospheres, so DLC 2 aimed to shake that up a bit. Shinonuma, or Swamp of Death, hosts an army base amidst World War II Japan. That is, until it suddenly hosts a crashed Element 115 meteor, swiftly converting the soldiers into rotting corpses. Why are we here? Because this German crazy scientist forgot his diary. Oh! Meet Dr. Edward Richthofen. Don't be afraid of death! Be afraid of the doctor! Get used to him. You'll be seeing a lot of him. <laughs> also, turns out he captured one of the soldiers from Vrucht. That, of course, being the one and only tank, Dempsey. Ooh, fucking raw, motherfuckers! And to finish off this stud crew are the Russian menace, Nikolai Belinsky. Reach for what good tonight! And the Japanese warrior, Takeo Masaki. The unholy shall kneel before the might of the honorable! Richtofen assembles this cast to assist him in his long-winded, earth-shattering endeavor in which his true intentions aren't all that totally transparent. Believe me, they aren't jolly campers. They're all here against their will. And they happen to also all be from opposing nations during wartime. Yet they somehow make an excellent crew, always having each other's backs. Which is surprising given they have every right to hate each other. This is the first cast of characters with genuine personalities, identities. Nikolai, the perpetually drunk commie with endless wives. Takio, the mellow, meticulous man. Dempsey, the overly prideful, all-American jarhead. And the supremely intelligent megalomaniac, Richtofen. There's a character for everyone. Someone you can relate to in one way or another. And collectively, they're impossible to dislike. Don't sound like freak bags. The mode debuts its first boss zombie ever, Hellhounds. Every five rounds or so they arrive, usually about a half dozen of them. Though intended to be a challenging round, they're no harder to kill than the zombies, and even offer you a max ammo reward for killing them. These rounds actually come as a relief, especially for high rounders as they're significantly quicker than the standard rounds and it refills your ammo. Dog rounds are, ironically, sort of a break. Don't get me wrong, they're fast and in high quantity. They can easily take advantage of an ill-prepared player, but assuming you've got a good loadout, you'll do just fine. Speaking of loadout, this map also introduces the very first non-ray gun wonder weapon. So, I, I guess the second wonder weapon, but this one is significantly better. I give you the Wunderwaff, DG2. Unlike the ray gun, the Wunderwaff serves infinite damage, meaning no matter what round you're on, it will kill. Not that it matters considering this map has endless glitches, including but not limited to a 24 zombie cap on all rounds and an inexplicable insta-kill glitch late in the game. No, seriously, rounds like this are actually very feasible with enough time. Out of the spout shoots a stream of electricity, chaining nearby zombies together in epic fashion. Machine. It was designed by none other than Richtofen, with the intent of being used against the Allies during World War II. The idea of weapons like this being used in a war setting gives me goosebumps. The Wonderwaff gave a whole new meaning to high rounds, as the Raygun shits the bed no later than round 30. It gave a whole new kind of power to the player. The swamp affects the gameplay in a way we hadn't experienced yet. Waste high water, debilitating mud, Thick foliage blanketing all around makes traversing this map difficult. The layout also explores new ground. Rather than being in one particular building, Shino divides itself into unique sections, each containing its own perk, weapons, traps. In general design, the perks generate at random. One hut may have the valuable jug, 
And another hut may have a not-so-valuable perk like Quick Revive. Regardless, it adds an element of surprise and makes each game different than the last. Oddly enough, there isn't a power switch, just one map removed from its debut. Instead, everything is on by default. Shino may not be the most exhilarating map, but its innovation and importance shouldn't be understated. In fact, this map began to change how the mode was played. Think about it. On Noct and Verruckt, it was a given that you would stay put in camp, but Shino provides much more space in those maps. Some breathing room, finally. Subsequently, players began to move around more, and thus the birth of the most used to day strategy out there. Training. Or in other words, moving around in a consistent loop in order to hoard up all the zombies for a mass grave, rather than picking them off one by one. Training, though not universally accepted right away, quickly became the main strategy, as it's quicker, more efficient, and less dangerous. Sure, you have to move around, which is like so physically demanding, uh, but it's a no-brainer. Though easier isn't the exact word I'd use, the mode was certainly becoming less oppressive. Maybe it's not so much Shino being easy as it is the other maps being overly challenging. Either way, Shino Numa was a step in the right direction. The beginning of the zombie storyline really starts here at the Duris facility near Breslau, Germany. This place is home to Group 935, an elite organization of scientists from all over the world dedicated to researching and experimenting with the newly discovered Element 115. The ultimate hope is to create an army of super soldiers and wonder weapons for the Nazis' war effort, who in exchange fund these projects. It's really here where the Wonderwaff, Ray Gun, and the new Symbol Monkeys were all designed. That song was driving me nuts! Meet Dr. Ludwig Maxis, the guy in charge. He and Richthofen make a great team, learning more about Element 115 every day. Together, they hope to accomplish the unimaginable. Richthofen kept to himself more and more as time went on, and Maxis grew suspicious. He was hardly ever around the facility anymore, and when he did have to work with Maxis, he seemed off, like he was plotting something, hiding something. Maxis did notice that Richthofen's aspirations with Element 115 were extremely high, dangerously high, and that perhaps he wanted to work alone going forward, but it didn't explain his erratic and manic outbursts. Turns out, Richthofen was working behind Maxis' back, on a teleporter. Yeah, a fucking teleporter. And it worked! Richthofen's intellect may perhaps be much higher than Maxis initially suspected, and fears his colleague may be losing himself. But even so, he never could have guessed what Richthofen had in store for him. Initiating test number six. Subject is within test chamber. Activate power. Damn it, Edward! Did you set up the device correctly? Yes, Doctor. As per your specifications. If you had done it to my specifications, then it would have worked, wouldn't it? As usual, your incompetence has... What? Do you hear that, Doctor? Quiet, you fool! Test number six is a failure, but the experiment has caused some kind of electrical force to energize within the chamber. Well, open the door! Doctor, I don't think... Open the door! Now! Damn it, Samantha! I told you never to come in here! Edward, get her out of here! Yes, Doctor. What's wrong with her? Daddy, what did you do? Lassie! Come back here! Samantha! Stop her! Easy! Come here, Samantha. Good girl, Lassie. Gently, Samantha. That's not Flossy anymore. We must get out of here. What? Edward, what are you doing? Open the door! Edward, open this door now! I'm, I'm scared! Don't go! Stay by me, Samantha! Goodbye, Dr. Maxis. <laughs> Doris takes inspiration from multiplayer's Nightfire, and even appeared in the campaign. 
sort of like every other map in this game. Shino taking inspiration from Macon, Verrucht from Asylum, and Noct from Airfield. The layouts are significantly different, naturally, since they're different modes altogether, but they share the same core. Doris's layout shares features of all previous maps. It shares Shinonuma's open space, but keeps some tight corridors like that of Noct and Verrucht. It features some spacious training areas, while also providing the single greatest camping spot in Zombies history. Remember how we were talking about teleporters earlier? Yeah, there's three of them, each in their own respective region. They teleport you back to the mainframe and spawn, and when all three are linked, God opens the gate to heaven. This is the brand new Pack-A-Punch machine, which, for a hefty 5,000 point fee, upgrades your weapon. Usually in every facet, like ammo count, damage output, rate of fire, reload speed, attachments, or its function entirely. It sounds like a lot up front, so I don't blame you for being hesitant. But trust me, it's absolutely worth it. When the rounds stack up and the points follow suit, that five grand quickly looks like petty cash. This upgrade is going to carry you so much further than had you not. Don't get me wrong, the Wonderwolf makes high rounds very achievable but also keep note of whether or not it shocks you in close range combat, because if it does, a glitch occurs where you automatically and permanently lose Jug's ability, despite the perk icon still appearing. Unless firing from long distances, using the Wonderwolf and Darice is a major risk, as you'll be resorted to the default to hit down, and paired with these seemingly magnetic zombies is a recipe for a swift death. Point is, Having the standard guns buffed helps balance that out a bit. It's an odd glitch that never occurred on Shino. Every map seems to have its own quirk. The once again returning electric trap and teleporters add for a much more complete experience, and the ability to upgrade sweeten the pot. Hellhounds return, and the Bowie knife makes its debut, which for 3,000 points works as a one knife until round 10, and still proves useful beyond. This adds a prominent melee play style for accumulating points on early rounds, which, despite there being a 3k deposit, is more profitable, as a melee kill is more than any other in the game, worth 130 points. Everything was finally coming together for zombies. The map layouts were no longer so basic. The player gains many quality of life improvements, including but not limited to better guns and strategies, and an increasingly deep and interesting story continues to develop. Darice truly was a revolution for zombies. The mode finally felt like it had reached a point where surviving long-term mattered, like it was finally 100% serious. I'll bet Treyarch knew during this map's development that this mode was just getting started, and that the possibilities are limitless. In 2008 when this game came out, I was 8. Yeah, the math is real easy, I'm 21 now. Since we've been desensitized to the horror of zombies for over a decade now, we've lost appreciation for World at War's horror, which it really prides itself on. Not the glitches or lack of depth. It doesn't provide the complexities or fine-tuned gameplay of recent games, but it does provide a truly horrifying, bare-bones, and fun mode. It's easy to disregard World at War when the GOAT conversation comes up, but it's invaluably a one-of-one -one experience. And of course, all games that came after wouldn't be possible without this game's success. World at War, the foundation, helps the rest of the building stand tall.